Haere mai, and welcome to Cult Chat, the podcast where we talk about coercion, control, and all things cultish. I'm Dr. Caroline Ansley. I'm a medical doctor. As a child, I lived at the Centrepoint community, a notorious cult in New Zealand, and now I run a website that advocates for the former children of the community. I'm Liz Gregory, and I run the Glory of Our Leavers Support Trust, and I'm privileged to walk alongside people after leaving this group as they embark on their new lives. And I'm Lindy Jacob. I'm a former member of the Exclusive Brethren, and I'm part of the Olive Leaf Network, a new initiative in Aotearoa to support leavers of high-demand religious groups. Come with us as we unpack the cult playbook. We'll be talking to experts and leavers of coercively controlling groups, and we will call for Kiwis to cult-proof their lives. Come with us as we traverse the cultiverse. A warning, this podcast contains references to subjects and discussions which may be difficult for some people to hear. Please take care of yourselves and your whānau when listening. Hi, Kaz here with my friend Anka Richter, who's the author of the fantastic book, Cult Trip. She's bringing us an exciting event this year. Thanks, Kaz. Australasia, get ready for Decult 2024, the first cult awareness conference in New Zealand, happening in Christchurch this October. Are you worried about a friend or family member who's in a group that may be causing them harm, or do you have your own story? Then join us for a weekend with experts from around the world where those who've left cultic groups can share their experiences and meet professionals who can help them. Head to our website, decult.net, for all the info. Come cult-proof your life at Decult 2024. I'll be there. Ah, oh, hello. Today it's just me from the Cult Tech team. Liz and Lindy are taking a break from recording this week because right now it's really crazy for both of them. There's still three of us today, though. I'm chatting with two friends of mine, Nat and Anka. Kia ora, both of you lovely ladies. Kia ora. Oh. Kia ora, Kaz and Nat. I've brought these two together for this conversation with me to talk about their work in the cultiverse. Nat, or Natalie Malkin, is the producer-director of the Warner Brothers documentary series, which was released a few weeks ago on TVNZ, called Escaping Utopia. It's an extraordinary series. It explores the reality of life for people living in Gloria Vale and the extremes they must go to to escape. Several years ago, Natalie also produced and directed the docudrama Heaven and Hell, the Centerpoint story, which stars yours truly, amongst others. The stories are completely different, but they're also scarily the same. Anka, or Anka Richter, as others might know her, is a journalist over ten, with over 10 years' experience at the coalface investigating the real harm behind the glossy fronts of culty groups, with experience investigating both Centrepoint and Gloria Vale. We have spoken to Anka on the show before. Check out episode 8, The Accidental Cult Reporter, to hear some more of Anka's backstory. As well as previous reporting and writing about both the Gloria Vale cult and the Centrepoint cult, right now Anka is neck deep in organising D-Cult, the first cult awareness and prevention conference New Zealand has ever had. So today we're going to talk about escaping utopia and Gloria Vale with a few splashes of Centrepoint thrown in for good measure. I hope with the knowledge that we all bring to the table we'll explore some of the complexities involved in uncovering the secrets hidden by harmful groups the challenges of navigating different narratives and the power of story to capture the public's attention. So, Nat, we'll start with you. Can you tell us a bit about the filming of Escaping Utopia? Well, the filming started in 2022. We got the funding, I think, and about halfway through the year we started filming and it went right through till the end of 2023 uh i think the thinking about the most challenging thing was probably the isolation and it was really hard to grasp that until you've actually been there i know you've been there anka it's so 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 far away from 
everywhere. The first time I went there was a black, black, black night. I hadn't been there during the day, so I had absolutely no bearings. And I was with my researcher. There's no street lights or anything. You know, you're on a gravel road and there's no cell phone reception around there. And it's just eerily quiet. And she was, she got really paranoid. So as we were driving along, every time we went past a farmhouse, she'd say, house, <laughs> house, <laughs> because she was so scared that we were going to get a puncture or um, or break down and, you know, with no cell phone reception and this sort of, you know, very, very dark part of the planet. And that was the night that I first met Boaz, who he snuck out from Gloria Vale very bravely mm. at about 10, 10 o'clock at night. And we met him at Marcus's house, who's the, the farmer in Escaping Utopia, and talked for probably about three hours. I think it was about one o'clock in the morning when we left. That was a remarkable interview, by the way. I was very struck by Boaz and hearing his story. Extremely moving. Yes. When we first started looking at Gloria Vale, I spoke to Liz Gregory from the Lever, your your co-host from the Levers Trust, mm -hmm. and she told me that I was absolutely dreaming that I would ever be able to talk to anybody on the inside of Gloria Vale. But in the time that it took us to get the funding, which was about, oh, I think we were we were trying to get funding for a good year and a half, things definitely started to shift inside Gloria Vale, and in that time more people were there was more unrest and yeah Boaz emerged as somebody who was willing to you know to to go on camera well, that, that 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 unveiling of and the the change and the move of him from his position of afraid and well he stayed afraid really throughout the whole thing but his bravery as he moved moved from that stuck position into a, yeah, exiting position. It's remarkable. Yeah. Oh, I mean, he he was he was so brave. He really did, you know, put his head on the line to to speak out. And you know, if he hadn't have left the community, would we have been able to tell that story? You know, we would have had to really look at that you know, because we didn't want to put anybody in danger, obviously. But, you know, thankfully, thankfully he, Tabitha, his wife, eventually got the courage to leave. So we were there sort of for that journey. I do yeah. wonder how much the involvement with you actually was part of that process for him of um, having those conversations on the outside. Well, yeah, I potentially that's it. I, I've never actually really thought about that, but yes, potentially, I guess the the more sort of exposure to other people, and it, obviously, it's not just me; it's my crew, and I, you know, had an amazing crew of, you know, really uh, uh, caring, kind people. So, I guess the more caring, kind people, yeah. And there's also something about telling your story to another person. I have to say, I've seen this over and over again, how confronting hearing your own narrative that you tell yourself. So it's not, not someone's not telling, imposing on you something else, but you're telling your own narrative in your own words to an interested person who just receives it. It's actually, it's extraordinary all by itself. Can I just tell you um, a little anecdote? Doubt about yeah. Boaz after he viewed the series. He said afterwards, he said, it's just seeing my name up on the screen, Boaz Benjamin. And then you the way you keyed my aunt, Boaz's aunt, and, and then my grandfather, Boaz's grandfather, I I I suddenly just realized that I am a person. Wow. I am somebody. So that was, you know, incredibly moving. I think I burst into tears when he said that. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, I am a person. I am somebody. Well, yeah. And now I just want to point out to listeners, we're, we're having a little bit of sound issues and Anka is uh, possibly popping in and out of this call because of her internet. So if she if she cuts out or disappears any anywhere along the way, I'm not even sure if you're still there right now. Anka, are you with us still? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I've been listening. You've been listening. <laughs> Good. Make a few noises every so often so we know you haven't vanished. <laughs> sure. I'm dominating. I'm dominating Anka. <laughs> No, that's good. Usually, I'm I'm the one to cut in and take over. So now, Natalie, you did you did you deserve to be dominating this conversation because you've done incredible work. Can I just say, as someone who really um, understands the landscape that you worked in, because you, we've been circling the same drain for for many years, right? We we worked together. Or I helped you a bit for the um, Heaven and Hell um, Center Point doco, and I've, I've I've I know so many of the people in your documentary now, and I would be the first first person to to be critical and go ah oh, she missed this or she doesn't know that or you know I'm not too I'm not so easy to be impressed by cult tacos to be honest because sometimes I feel I've I've seen it all and I know too much you have done an amazing you've done amazing work and I cannot thank you enough for what you've done and and the nuance and the the, the survivor focus the the shocking parts the heart rendering stories but there also the yeah the just the psychology of it all and and following someone like Boaz and how how he's leaving and actually do for people to get up close get a feel for how conflicting it all is that it, it isn't just just joy because someone's out and then life is fine because they're finally out of the evil cult it's so much more so much more complex and I think you've you've captured that really well so thank you thank you Anka that means a lot from you okay. Nat, I'm curious to know what were the parallels that you found in the filming of these two different documentaries, one about Gloria Vale and one about Centrepoint? Definitely some key parallels. I think for listeners who are not familiar with the Centrepoint story, it was founded in the late 1970s, early 80s, in Albany, just north of Auckland. And it had a leader by the name of Bert Potter. I think at its height, it had about 300 members. So even at its capacity, still half the size the glory of our community is today. And it was based on therapy. So it called itself a therapeutic community. And the people there spent a large chunk of their time partaking in various group therapy sessions with one of the main focuses being sexuality and breaking down boundaries around sex. So there was lots of very public sex and nudity. And when people joined Centrepoint, they did so with the knowledge that that was what they were joining, which is very different from the community that the people that joined Gloria Vale joined. So in contrast, Gloria Vale began a decade earlier. Its founder's name was Neville Cooper, and he was a travelling evangelist from Australia. And the reason most of the early members joined this group was, for the most part, they were devout Christians, and they joined because they thought it was some sort of utopian socialist society they shared all their possessions everyone was equal and they were out there you know wanting to do good in the in the world and in the community so both of them the 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 parallel is they were both founded on a premise that they share all their belongings which is where I think they both started to go off track as well so they started stripping back their identities and their lives before so it started with the clothing and center point they they shared a wardrobe so basically a shared wardrobe first in best dressed you know it was whoever got there first got to got the pick of the outfit but everyone no one was allowed their own clothes and in Gloria, Gloria Val, of course, as we know, they um they have a uniform. Mm, it's an interesting 
that you noticed that actually yeah and and they that that was sort of the beginning I guess of sort of you know making themselves different different from the outside world cutting them off was what followed so so first of all they sort of stripped them back losing their identities their individuality and then both Bert and Neville started to instruct them to, you know, limit the, the contact with the outside world and stop contact with their families. And they both started talking about the outside world. So that concept that the outside mm. was inferior to the inside, you know, the inside, they're the knowing ones. They know better than society. The laws don't need to apply, you know. They've got superior, their superior knowledge. They're the enlightened ones. Yeah, they both, that's where they sort of start veering off from their initial dream, you know, as their, as the leaders sort of gain their power. It, it's like they they also gained the, I don't know, the the. The more the more control they got they got the more they wanted yes and unfortunately the other thing that the two leaders had in common is that they both you know as they got more power they started indulging in some pretty sick sexual abuse and both of them were convicted of sexual offenses both of them actually were both in prison at the same time in the 1990s, one in the North Island and one in the South Island. And then um, when they both came out, they returned to that community where their victims were. Yes, but the difference is, of course, that that Hopeful, or Neville, who became Hopeful, he, he only served 11 months of his five-year sentence, so he was back really quickly whereas I think Bert Anka you probably can correct me if I'm wrong I think he was in prison for about nine years so you know oh, by I the time he came out the, the community had moved on yeah your thoughts Anka yeah that's a that's 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 a good point um that the community in Albany was definitely changing when Bert was in prison and then that that did also make people leave. I don't know if that was the case in Gloriva because in Gloriva they could always uphold this narrative that that the convictions weren't rightful. He was just convicted because he spread the gospel. Mm. In fact, there are still people today in Gloriva who do not actually know, let alone believe, or do not actually know that his convictions his convictions were for sexual abuse. Yeah. So that's that's an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah, and also I, in uh, in Center Point, there were these other convictions. Uh, more people were went to prison, and also the um, drug manufacturing that they did there on the premises, and that they they took these psychedelics together with with teenagers was a bit of a different thing. Yeah, I can I can add more too, but but go on that. It's it's really great to hear your analysis. Well, the other thing that I that I realize that they have in common, the two leaders. I'm just focusing on the leaders at the moment. Is they were both salesmen before they they became cult leaders they both I think Hopeful was a sewing machine salesman and Bert sold vacuum cleaners I think is that right but yeah, yeah absolutely and he was also a pest con he had a massive pest control company that actually was all over New Zealand yes that's right so I mean that's fascinating in itself isn't it I think they were both door-to-door -door salesmen. Yeah, um, I think it's fair to say they were both um, very good at hooking people, selling something to them, finding their flock, and then taking taking those people under false pretense in a totally wrong direction. I think they absolutely had that in common. Yes, they moved on to selling ideas, right? Yeah, yeah. And they were also the other thing that is that they had in common is that they were significantly older than the people they recruited. They were both born in I think they were both born in 1925 or 1926. They're both born the same year. 
and I think uh, Neville was in his 40s when he started gathering people for his community and Bert, he was, I think he was in his 50s. And that reminds me of David Berg, the leader of the Children of God. He also was a generation older than his followers and they used to call him dad or father and the, ch- the their children called him grandpa. So there's something in this. Mm, I mean, there is something alarming, isn't there, about mm. people older than their, can, the people that they're mm. hanging out with. You know, it's always a red flag, isn't it? Yeah, mentor or fatherly figure. Okay, so Anka, you must have got some thoughts on this, the parallels that you found in your research. Yeah, the most surprising parallel was for me, um, have done quite a few years of research into Centerpoint. At the time, I wasn't aware of Gloria Val at all, to be honest, until someone actually from Centerpoint, Barry Leslie, made me aware of them. But um, never had never thought of Gloria Val as being anything similar to a, a sex card, as what Centerpoint was always labelled. But these parallels are actually there, and it starts with the the shared living quarters, the bedrooms of families together with parents watching them being being there when they were having sex and also within the communities, not just the centre band, but also in the early days at um, Gloryville, there being such a quite quite an emphasis or almost like a an unconditioning or rewiring of the members to embrace sex in a different way and be really natural about it, to practice it together in Glory Val in, in under the sort of pretense of marriage, educational marriage counseling. And that was shown in the doco in, in a in a tasteful way, just to get an idea of what they did there, because that's certainly not something that came that really came out or that Glory Val was known for. But the normalization or just sort of I mean, I would now say probably for the gratification of of the leaders of the community to basically introduce something that would then also make it easier for them to have access to to younger people and to put their warp views on on everyone by creating that kind of very sexualized culture that Gloravel also had, especially, but I think still has, and definitely a sexual abuse culture. So those parallels were definitely there. And then with the the breakdown of the family unit, I think it's also true for both groups where the parents are not so much in charge anymore, where in, where the kids in center point just ran free as a pack, the teenagers, there was no supervision. There were awful levels of, of neglect of children feeling totally lost, not seeing their, their parents for days or so, having guardians who weren't actually protecting them or looking after them. And in Gloryville, even though it's 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 different because there is so much discipline and um, the children get to work really hard, but then the parents are not really the authority in the end it's actually always the leaders and then that leads to yeah the parents also losing losing a say losing their voice when something goes wrong especially when it comes or came to the sexual abuse and we've seen this and heard this from former members of center point and definitely also in glory Vale, where parents try to intervene when something bad happened to their children especially sexual abuse and they just didn't didn't have the power to really do anything about it and then the parallels of the us and versus them you don't go to the police you don't talk to the outside this is all be dealt with in-house we know what's best then that leads to these similar similar toxic abusive cultic oppressive dynamics Mm, those are fantastic parallels this is such an interesting conversation to tie these two groups together because ultimately what what I care about here is that this media expose that we're currently going through around Gloria Vale which I believe will settle down and people will forget when we pull center point into this we remember that this is while it is about Gloria Vale it's also about culty groups that spread and grow and when Gloria Vale stops being in the public eye Maybe there'll be another group that grows up, or it certainly Glory of Our will continue to cause harm unless something significant changes what's happening with them. But these these are great, great um, answers, guys. Anka, you interviewed somebody who had been in both communities. Did I? 
<laughs> yes, I remember you sent Hang me on. you sent me a mystery box full of research notes when I when we were working on Center Point, and you did interview somebody who was I think he was doing a theology degree, and he had he was living in Center Point, but he was going down to Gloria Vale. And uh, and coming back and reporting to Bert Potter on on what Hopeful Christian was up to. Well, I know that they <laughs> that the two leaders, Hopeful and Bert, that they were kind of competing in some ways. They were definitely watching each other. What what it what the other one was doing. They were in the same business. They knew they were in the same game. So isn't that fascinating where you where you think that they're at such different ends of the spectrum and yet they had so much in common. And I think what we really need to focus on here is the well-being of the children and how long that was ignored and how how often even authorities, at least with center point, were in cahoots with the cult and you kind of wonder whether that's still happening or was happening for a long time in Gloryville with the locals there with the former mayor of Greymouth who sat in the first row of the Gloryville concert being very chummy with a convicted pedophile hope for Christian because Gloryville is big business. Yeah it is indeed and we've talked a bit here now about the parallels so I'm, I'm actually also wondering both of you in your work in the cultiverse running alongside, circling the same drain. Have you noticed any differences, significant differences between the community that aren't just the obvious ideological doctrine ones? Because those are obvious differences. Nat, how about you? I guess that a big difference is, um, you know, in Centre Point, people joined because they were seeking fulfilment and, and happiness and there were a lot of really damaged people that joined Centerpoint for therapy because they genuinely needed something because life their, their, their lives were, were not in, in great shape. Whereas in Gloria Vale, joy or happiness is not actually the goal. And I think this has, you know, evolved as well. But you would have seen in the documentary, suffering for mm. Christ is a positive. So the more they suffer in this life, the more rewards they'll get in the next one. So it's not self-indulgent. <laughs> it's um it's it's yeah, joy is not a good thing in Gloria Vale. And it's it's why they put up with such terrible conditions, because actually if you're suffering for Christ, you you it's seen as a positive. Well, it's um, actually a great, great um, doctrine for cult leader, really, because it's it, it puts the members in a perfect position to abuse them, really, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And do you know what the other the other thing about that is? If if somebody has a talent in something in Gloria Vale, they will purposely not let them fulfill that talent so for instance one of uh, one of the people we interviewed had a talent for writing and they were given a job in the one of the mills working in a in a really sort of menial position another person we interviewed was you know definitely uh, more of a, an outdoor type person and he was told he had to be a teacher. So it was like they purposefully tried to dissuade anybody from fulfilling any sort of passion or anything that, that they enjoyed doing. It's really interesting, huh? Because I think Centerpoint prided itself on fostering people's creativity and they had all mm -hmm. these workshops. And I remember Angie, the, the teenager from... Center Point, who I first met and who was the starting point for my book, she was sent off to drama school, and Center Point actually paid for them, so paid for that. So that's quite a difference. I'm I can add some more too because I think the public perception is quite different and was quite different. That maybe there was always more suspicion on Center Point because they were seen as this free love community, maybe with a bit of a hippie feel to it, whereas. Gloria, being being Christian, there's this assumption that 
Christians must be maybe Christians must be good people per se and and they will they will do the right thing even though it's very conservative and but there's this almost like the cover of religious freedom that center point didn't enjoy in the same way even though they're classified as a religion and but Potter called himself God and the other thing that I've seen now especially watching your documentary Natalie, and also with the interviews that I did back then for Centerpoint and the ones afterwards that with Gloria Val, we have second, so many second generation leavers, right? Most of the people inside Gloria Val have been born in there and mm-hmm. are now children. So you see many, many more coming out who've never, ever known another world. Mm-hmm. And the, these invisible prison walls are so much bigger. And the culture shock of and then being a refugee in your own country when you come out. So that's a lot more extreme than what people experienced who left Centerpoint, who still had a lot to work through, who lost so much, who had these awful interpersonal um, situations in their families of repair work where you had perpetrators and victims in the same families. I guess that's true for Gloria Bell too, by the way. But but the cultural divide is, of course, a lot bigger for Gloria Bell than it was back then for center point leavers. Absolutely. We're in, you know, third and fourth generation of members in Gloria Vale. So and that's so that's the biggest difference is Gloria Vale is still going strong. So it's been allowed to flourish. You know, it's been it's been going for 50 years. And they don't actually need to brainwash people there because somebody, one of my contributors talked about them getting their factory settings created as babies. They're indoctrinated from birth. So that is the only world they have ever been exposed to. So when I hear people say, leave them alone, they choose to live in glory and veil. Sorry. No, not if you're born into it. That is a significant difference because there were babies, lots of babies born at centre point, but not many. I think, I don't know how many, I don't think there were any were there who were born, they couldn't have because it wasn't going for long enough, born and stayed throughout and then became adults. If there were, there was a a small number of people who genuinely had their whole life within that community and then entered adulthood. By the time they entered adulthood, because of the length of time it was running, it was 22 years, at, at best, they would have been in the early 20s if there was such a person. So as opposed to almost everyone at Gloria Vale being in that second generation, their whole life, no other life. And the other other key difference, of course, is in Centrepoint, the, the kids went to schools outside the community. Yes. So they were exposed to, you know, uh, to the outside world a lot more yeah, and I, I was at that school, you know, the first school that they joined. So that was, you know, I've got some insight into what that was like. They definitely were, were separated and they were different and they were they were treated like they were, um, you know, a bit like lepers in, in the school. So there was an automatic social divide that reminds me a bit of the Brethren's, the exclusive Brethren's, how initially when they had their own, uh, didn't have their own schooling, it was, they were very socially divided. And social division is pretty powerful. I mean, you don't talk to people about what's going on. You don't share, you don't connect, you don't form deep relationships, but it's not anywhere like literally no connection, which is what happens at Gloria Vale, no connection with the outside world. I want to throw in one more thing that Gloria Vale, unlike Centerpoint, had fantastic propaganda, <laughs> which we all watched a few <laughs> years ago on TVNZ. And I know that Centerpoint, there was a documentary, a fly in a war documentary in the early days made about them, and it probably brought a lot of people to Centerpoint as well. They were just curious about it. But at the time the Gloreval documentaries were made, um, 2016, 2017, there were already reports there was already enough knowledge about some of the things that happened. And again, the question, have we learned nothing from center point? Shouldn't someone have approached this community with a different angle to film them? But we had these sugar-coated um, documentaries, I call them flockumentaries, that were basically called propaganda and that actually prolonged the harm. And they created this sort of false impression to the public and, and just led to more fascination, voyeurism, 
mockery, um, even even some kind of fandom, which we certainly didn't see with Centerpoint. They were, you know, they were at some point just seen as this this cesspit. But Gloriavel enjoyed many years not being under uh, public scrutiny or only being under, you know, only being portrayed in this sugar-coated way that I think was absolutely irresponsible. So let's talk about that too, please. Yes, they they became, you know, the joke of the nation, didn't they? Yeah. You know, the kooky Christians and their and their, you know, strange outfits. Uh, that, you know, there was actually a couple of quite prominent radio hosts and comedians who actually dressed up as Gloria Vale people and really, really made a mockery of them. It's it's actually really appalling and quite disgusting. Some of them are still on YouTube. <laughs> And you know, I think I think that, that is that it's actually embarrassing, it's embarrassing that we as a nation let that happen. You know, you get go online and find your glory of our name. It, yeah, they really were the laughing stock, and we I, look down at them. I think that there are groups of people as our society gets more and more inclusive. There are groups of people that slowly become no longer acceptable to other no longer acceptable to mock and um, mm. make ridiculous joke of. And yeah. it used to be groups, it used to be disabled people or it used to be people in the LGBTQ community. It used to be trans people, you know, and now I think it's still okay to mock and make a laughing stock of cult members and cult leavers. But I'm hoping our work will change that, that as mm. they become real people with with understandable decisions that they made, with under, understandable and, and, and deep suffering that we, we kind of get and we resonate with, it will no longer be acceptable to do what you've just described as being, you know, in the 2014, 15, when those documentaries came out, that's not that long ago that everyone literally was joking about them. And, and do you know what one of the most um, common feedback I've heard since my documentaries have come out is that the, the they were surprised at how eloquent and mm. likeable and kind and caring uh, the contributors are. You know what? One of their contributors was in the other one. It's just that this time they were allowed to be themselves. That yes. was the glory of our version. That's Pearl That's I'm right. talking about. That was the glory of our version of her. Mm. And you know what? She is cool. She is feisty. She is funny. You know, uh, she's really good company. She is, you know, strong. She's mm. smart. All the things that she yeah. did not appear to be in those other documentaries because she wasn't allowed to be here. So yeah. it's busting open this idea that members of cults or former members of cults are stupid naive, all these sort of really horrible stereotypes. Let's bust open another thing too. Why are we still doing business with cults? Why don't we boycott cults like we are boycotting countries that, mm. you know, that are involved in, in war crimes or whatever? You know, Why don't we have the same sanctions? Why don't we have the same awareness here in New Zealand? It's always bugged me that all these years that Gloriavel exists, especially those last years when people flocked to their concerts, and these concerts were a big show attraction here in the South Island. People even came from overseas because it was just such a fun thing to watch and probably a lot of voyeurism in there. But why do why did people go there and not have you know, why, why didn't we see people outside, women's groups for instance, political mm. parties, activists protesting for women's rights and saying this this is a gulag this is not this is not okay these these people in here are suffering yes you might say it wasn't always it wasn't that wasn't enough media back then we didn't know this but we've known we since know and i'm i'm still waiting for the the public outcry especially for the rights of women and children in there and i think there's been a bit of a, a a deafening silence as if this wasn't the cool thing to stick up for these people and i think this is where what you just said, um, 
has comes in because these people are so easy to mock and shame and they're almost seen as well they chose this it's kind of their fault why should we feel that sorry for them if they want to follow this this leader and live in that way and wear these stupid blue frocks right so the compassion then then ends there and the voyeurism kicks in and i think it's it's time that we stop doing business and financially supporting cults and that goes goes you know, for all levels, with banks and with dairy companies and honey and you name it, let's let's have lists where these where their products are listed and let's hit them hard where it hurts. It's where, where the money is. Well, and maybe stop paying them working for families. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Or charitable. I mean, let's the, the obvious uh, question is also uh, charitable status. How come they get tax breaks doing doing what they're doing? It's just yeah. unfathomable to me. Yeah. Could I um could I make a little segue? Because I really want to talk about this before we run out of time. One of the one of the favorite things that I my favorite things about about escaping utopia was the 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 revelation of all the work of Melanie Reed. That's her name, isn't it? The journalist in, in 1993. And that was a fantastic, a humorous even but devastating as well, mm. to discover that this strong woman in her, what, well, she was in her 20s, wasn't she, when she did the work in 1993? Yes, I think she said she was 26. Yes, she went into Gloria Vale, pretended that she was a Gloria Vale woman, and started uh, undercover recording, interviewed some um, leavers, exposed a lot of the stuff that has come out in your documentary, Nat. And it's just... It, it just rams home the point that, well, two points. First, how quickly we forget all that new information in 1993 is, was, was lost to us. And secondly, the extraordinary role of journalism in the media and how much journalism in the media were vilified by Centrepoint and continue, it continues to be part of the narrative from older Centrepoint uh, people who were once members, that the harm has come from the media exposing what happened at Centre Point. And right now, I'm not thinking that the harm happening at Glory Vale is because of your documentary, Nat. I, I, I'm not saying that, but I can hear that story coming out later on. Mm. The harm actually is the media, not what happened at Glory Vale, because that's the narrative of the Centre Point people. These kids were harmed by the media expose, not by what happened at Centrepoint. Yeah, it's yeah. so interesting because I, I came up against this so much, you know, when I started my my big round of, of research about 10 years ago and the suspicion and the silencing and also the families that were shutting their kids, you know, by then adult kids down not to not to come and talk to me. And this narrative of, oh, well, this happens, what happened at the center point happens everywhere. It's just the media that wants to sensationalize this. Mm -hmm. I had to, I had to, you know, cut through and break through so much before I even got access to some people and you know one person who'd never even ever told her story to to anyone before in her life really and then she actually did trust a journalist ironically enough or maybe very telling yeah that I, I I happen to be that person but it shouldn't be like that it shouldn't be like that and I think media needs to also recognize that we we need to be more nuanced and it's not just about who's the villain in the story, but also what are who are the real people here, and what has brought them in, and what has spat them out, and not and this whole um, us versus them. Oh, look at these weirdos and these groups. You know, there's a lot of trauma porn happening at the moment with with some of the cult reporting that's that's that going on. I mean, it's gotten a lot better. I'm pleased to. I mean, I'm so pleased to see this documentary, Natalie. Honestly, can't tell you enough what a fantastic job you've done. And I wish we would see more of that because that's the only way people not just on the outside get it, but maybe also the people on the inside, if they have access to it and can watch this. I, I, I just hope the way that you've told the story that something will land for them as well. Yes, well, I've already had some feedback, actually, that people inside are watching. I just got a message last night from somebody saying that their nephew had watched it um, and was outraged that he'd been told so many lies. And my hope, actually, is that the leaders of Glory Vale watch it because one thing that I keep thinking is they actually can still be on the right side of history. 
it's yeah. not too late for them. Like, it's too late for hopeful Christian. He's dead. But yeah. they are actually in a position to say, maybe we didn't get this right. Maybe we got it wrong. You know, that the community looks to them to make their decisions. They have power. They can change this. They can they can say, let's rejoin the outside world. Let's end the separation, stop the control, you know, stop all the stupid rules and stop living. This is the one thing that I keep coming back to and it, and it really struck me in India is they are living Hopeful's dream. They're all living Hopeful's dream. He's dead. Yeah, he was they're corrupt. Su they're suffering. <laughs> they're dead. suffering they're for this dream. Still, they're suffering they're for this dream. They're all living a dead man's dream. And he actually, you know, he, he got it wrong. That, that's my hope. I want the, I do know that the uh, the current overseen shepherd has watched it. I do know wow. that. And I understand that everybody in the film and I, and, and the filmmakers as well are, are, are being pre prayed for. So it's quite comforting. Oh, gosh, you just want to be a fly on the wall there in one of those servant and shepherd meetings when they when they watched it. Or I, I personally don't have high hopes for people who are so indoctrinated and have upheld that system for so long and so brutally that there would be a big change of heart. But you never know. You never, you never know. And I mean, I, you know, I met Howard um, Temple, actually. I just rocked up there at the community in, at Gloria Vale um, a few years ago and, and just surprised them. I just, I just drove and I actually got to talk to him. And yeah, he seemed kind of apologetic, downplaying things. Oh, we weren't aware of this and that, but now we are. And yeah, mistakes happen and da 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 da, da. And then not that long afterwards, um, he was actually arrested as well for his sexual, alleged sexual yeah. transgressions. And I mean, if we could we could film inside the brains of these people, we would learn a lot, right? Mm. You never know. Yeah. I, I We did the same thing, Anka. We, we drove up and met with Howard as well. And he gave us a tour, which was 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 actually really valuable for us to just, you know, be in there and see it with our own eyes. So, you know, going into that huge and did you did you get a tour, Anka? No, I didn't get a tour. I missed uh, it. <laughs> I so got the concert. Going and in, going into that kitchen, that industrial kitchen and seeing Oh yeah. I was know, in the kitchen. I was in the kitchen and the yeah. wardrobe rooms and that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Huge and that massive hall, you know, with all of the like, we just looked up and saw all of those, all of the lighting rig in there, which they obviously were from all their concerts. I mean, yeah. you know, this is expensive equipment that they have. Um, but yeah. just seeing seeing the the woman and seeing the the young girls working in the kitchen with their you know eyes down, yeah. too scared to even look at us, you know. Um, yeah, it was it was a, a good reminder of the why of why we were telling the story. Yeah. Well, I think a good reminder of the why is also the last part of of the doco, which was was for me it was that was quite an that, that was a new material because everything else in the doco, even though I didn't, I mean, I met a lot of familiar faces again. It was a, a lot of deja vu's like like Marcus Tuck and so many others, Rosanna, and then also seeing her story retold, which I find so heartbreaking and so incredible. And the way how it was was reenacted really, really brought the across what they did to her when they kidnapped her and flew her around. But what was new for me was, Theo and Rosanna going to India and then actually seeing that place and seeing her sister looking so broken or dissociated mm. and hearing them talk so openly about rape culture and normalizing that. I mean, I thought I'd heard and seen it all when it comes to Gloria, but I can almost be a bit blasé about it sometimes and have compassion fatigue, you know, just because I think, oh yeah, now for me that doesn't shock me because I've known these things, but that was another level of shock to see that and and just to get my head around that you're the first person there with a the camera team who's actually rocked up there and exposed this because I think others could have done that too. Theo has been trying to get media attention for this and 
you know, you wonder why is it so hard? Why 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 shouldn't this be a priority that we we expose this? So I'm really glad it's finally happening. Hopefully, it does put some pressure on authorities to do something. But if they're not even able to dismantle a cult right under their nose in the South Island, you wonder how much can they do in the South in in South Asia, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's very, very complex because, of course, if, you know, if the police rushed in there, the woman there would say, we don't want to leave. So it's yeah. it's, it it's very complex. Um, yep. that, it, was, it was heartbreaking. And the contrast between Theo and Rosanna mm. and the woman that they had grown up with was just, you know, it was so huge. There's, there's two vibrant confident woman who've been out there in the world and that you know they're both very inspiring people to see see them with their sort of you know family and friends that they grew up with who have not had any freedom um it was yeah quite a contrast so you you did actually make that really clear in the documentary and i i it is what has sat with me as well this just continued sense of when you know um Liz Liz keeps on talking about Liz Gregory my co-host keeps on talking about um you have to stop these groups before they get too big and mm -hmm. and you know what is set with me is the knowledge that that is the goal of this community is to go overseas to mix up the bloodline there will be more women mm -hmm. like precious and that is why it is so urgent that something is done now because at the moment the oldest children in that community, I think, are around 13 or 14. And it will not be long before the next generation is bred in that community. And once we get to that next generation, there's no rights, no rights under New Zealand law. At the moment, those children have got New Zealand-born mothers, yeah, which exactly. gives them some rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But once you get to that next generation... Um, there, there are no rights. So it's really, really crucial that intervention happens now. Or, you know, Faithful said he has he had done some maths and he thought that in 10 years' time there was going to be 200 people in that community. Faithful <laughs> is the son of Hopeful Christian. No, Faithful is the leader in... Uh, in yes, the Indian leader in India, Glory yes. Yes, okay. There's a lot of names that I'm muddling. Yeah, I know. It does get quite Sorry. confusing. Yeah, it does. Okay, well, gosh. We have somehow managed to get to the end of our time, ladies. We've had a lot of complexity. I think we could go for <laughs> we could keep going. We could keep going. And it, and I, I think that this conversation we've had is really quite unique because of our own connections. Yeah. And yeah, and I thank you so much, Anka Annette, for joining me to talk about this topic. So if you haven't already, please consider watching Escaping Utopia, the three-episode um, documentary about Gloria Vale that Nat has just spent a couple of years of her life filming and is on TVNZ On Demand. Uh, can it be viewed by our international guests at all, Nat? Is there a plan for that? Uh, not as yet, but watch the space, hopefully. Watch the space. Okay, so I'm looking forward to that. And also check out Decult. We didn't actually talk about that uh, at all during this interview, but we are talking about it repeatedly on Cult Chat. One of um, Anka's total drivers is to get a cult awareness conference here in New Zealand, and it's planned and it's happening in October here in Christchurch can go to decult.net and sign up to receive their newsletter and you'll be the first to hear when tickets are available if you do that. And as well as Escaping Utopia, don't forget to listen up and watch Heaven in Hell, the Centrepoint story, which is also on TVNZ On Demand. For international viewers, I, I'm not sure if you can get it overseas other than on YouTube, which you can find on the Centrepoint Restoration Project site. I've got a link to the Heaven and Hell documentary on there where you can learn more about Centrepoint and the Centrepoint documentary that Nat filmed. So we hope there's been something for you today in today's episode which might help you to cult-proof your life. Please keep listening to more of the episodes of Cult Chat on Plains FM, Apple Podcasts, Spotify or on our YouTube channel. 
Tell your friends about the show. Share, leave a review on our Facebook page or on other social media. And thank you so much, ladies. Uh, it's been great having you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. If anything in today's episode was difficult or upsetting for you and you would like to talk to somebody, we encourage our New Zealand listeners to free call or text 1737 for support from a trained counsellor. Or you might like to visit the resources section of the Olive Leaf Network website where you can find a range of organisations and resources that might be able to support you. We would also like to remind you that the views and thoughts and opinions that have been expressed in this programme are the speakers alone and Cult Chat does not necessarily endorse or share them.